Welcome back to Game Theory 101. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is dominance invasion games. We've seen a ton of dominance with complete information, and under those circumstances, it's relatively straightforward. Here, however, with incomplete information, dominance starts appearing in weird and unexpected ways. Since dominance is such an integral part of solving any game, regardless of whether we're complete information or incomplete information, it's very important that we understand it, and so that's why we have an entire lecture devoted to dominance invasion games. As it turns out, there are two different types of dominance in these games of incomplete information. We have ex-ante dominance and iterum dominance. The difference is that in one case we're going to be focusing on a player, and in the other case we're going to be focusing on specific types. Ex-ante deals with the player. An ex-ante dominated strategy is a strategy for a player such that an alternative strategy for that player provides a greater payoff, once again, for that player, regardless of all other players' strategies. So we have player being repeated three times there with ex-ante dominance. An iterum dominated strategy is a strategy for a type such that an alternative strategy for that type provides a greater payoff, again, for that type, regardless of all other players' strategies. So in that second case, we're dedicated to types rather than players. I've talked about this distinction before, but let's hammer home this point with another example. Imagine that you're going to play poker tonight. A very simple poker game where you can either be dealt aces or do seven. There are only two hands here. If you're developing a strategy, you could be thinking about this under one of two different circumstances. First circumstance is that you've sat down at the table and you have not actually yet been dealt your hand. So you don't know whether you are going to be getting aces or do seven. That doesn't stop you from formulating a plan, of course. You could think about what you will do given that you've been dealt aces, and you can think about what you're going to do given that you've been dealt do seven, not actually yet having been dealt that. If we're looking at dominance under those circumstances, then we're looking at ex ante dominance. But there's another way to think about strategies here. There could be a circumstance where you're actually dealt a hand. Of course, that's going to happen eventually if you're playing poker. Eventually, you'll have a hand and you'll be looking at it. Well, at that point, you've been assigned a specific type. Maybe you've been assigned aces. Maybe you've been assigned do seven. Well, now that you have a type, Maybe your circumstances are a little bit different. Now you know exactly what you're doing. Maybe you need to think again about your strategy under those circumstances. If we have dominance under those circumstances, after you've been assigned a particular type, or in this case a hand in poker, then we're looking at iterum dominance. In fact, we've seen iterum dominance before. You might recall this lecture on the prisoner's dilemma versus stag hunt type. Here we have player one not knowing player two's type, and player two knowing her type. Two-tenths of the time, she's a prisoner's dilemma type. Eight-tenths of the time, she's a stag hunt type. So for her, she has complete information. And if she's been assigned this prisoner's dilemma type, of course, if you're a prisoner's dilemma type, you have prisoner's dilemma payoffs, and so you have a dominated strategy. Left is dominated by right. Four is greater than three. Two is greater than one. Right is always better than left. So this is an example of iterum dominance. Right, iterum dominates left. Conditional on having been assigned a type, we now have a dominated strategy. We've also seen a case of ex-ante dominance. And in fact, we saw it with this game as well. If we map out these payoffs moving up a step, rather than thinking about specific types and looking at the matrices of those types, if we instead look at the overall game for the player rather than the type before player two has actually been assigned a type, well, now we've actually seen an example of ex ante dominance here. So in this case, right left strictly dominates left left, and right right strictly dominates left right. Well, you might notice that there's a reason, and we talked about this last time as well that we have dominance appearing here. If we know that the prisoner's dilemma type is never going to want to play left, then it stands to reason that before that, moving a step up, the player would never want to develop a strategy where conditional on her type being the prisoner's dilemma type, that she would play left. 
that she should be playing right under those circumstances instead. And this is in fact a law about dominance in Bayesian games. If a strategy is interim dominated, then it is ex ante dominated, just as we saw there. What's interesting though, and what you might not expect, is that the converse is not true. If a strategy is ex ante dominated, there may or may not be any corresponding interim dominance. That means that ex ante is a stronger form of dominance, because interim dominance implies ex ante dominance, but not the other way around. This also means that ex ante dominance is a little bit harder to see, because you can break these things down with interim dominance and just look at the smaller matrices and find dominance under those circumstances. But when we're looking at ex ante dominance, it's not that simple. Here's an example. In this game, we have player two half of the time as an A type and half of the time as a B type. Player two knows which type she is. Player one does not know which type she is. I'm going to make a claim here. I'm going to make a claim that there's dominance in this game, specifically X anti dominance. But notice that there's no iterum dominance. If player one were to play up, then the A type would want to play right because five is greater than two. And the B type would as well, 5 is greater than 4. But when player 1 plays down, now the A type would rather play left, 2 is greater than 1, and the B type would rather play left as well, 4 is greater than 1. So what both the A and the B type want to do actually depend on what player 1 chooses. There's no single strategy for either type that is always going to be better. But despite the fact that there is no interim dominance, I claim that right-left, ex-ante strictly dominates left-right. So the first of those strategies is the strategy for A, the second strategy is the strategy for B. So right-left or RL means that the A type plays right and the B type plays left. Let's look into why this is the case. Let's first look at the dominated strategy. This is left-right. The A type is playing left and the B type is playing right. Under these circumstances, the A type receives a guaranteed payoff of two. The B type, some probability of the time, some portion of the time will receive five, and the remaining portion of the time she'll receive one. It's some convex combination of five and one. What that exact convex combination is will depend on the mixed strategy or the pure strategy of player one, but it's something that is between five and one. Now let's compare that to right-left. This is the one that strictly dominates the strategy that you see on your screen here. Well, under those circumstances, the A-type will receive that same mixture between 5 and 1, that same convex combination between 5 and 1. We don't know what it is, but holding player 1 strategy fixed, it's going to be identical to whatever was the case in the previous instance when we were looking at left-right. Meanwhile, the B-type will receive a guaranteed payoff of 4. So you should notice that under these circumstances, player two receives a strictly higher payoff than if she had played the alternative strategy. That's because in one circumstance, she's getting guaranteed fours, in this case, whenever she's one type. But in this case, she's getting guaranteed twos instead. So as a result, player one would not want to adopt this strategy, left, right, LR. And the intuition here is that this strategy requires the A type to play against its comparative advantage and the B type to also play against its comparative advantage. So rather than have the types play the thing that they're relatively weaker in, the right-left strategy says to do the opposite. B is stronger at playing left than A is, and so B should be playing left and A should be playing right. And if you were to develop this full game matrix as the player, like we did when we converted that Prisoner's Dilemma stag hunt game from two individual matrices to a single matrix, you would actually recover this fact that right-left x anti strictly dominates left-right. There's one other way that strict dominance can appear that you might not expect. Let's look at the following game. Here, player two is a Prisoner's Dilemma type with probability 0.9, and a stag hunt type with probability 0.1. So in fact, this is the exact same game that we've seen previously, looking at Prisoner's Dilemma versus Stag Hunt, except we have a relatively different weighting for the two different types. 
Now this prisoner's dilemma type is very, very likely, whereas the stag hunt type is relatively unlikely. We know that through interim dominance, the prisoner's dilemma type has a strictly dominated strategy. Right strictly dominates left, so we should remove that for player two as the prisoner's dilemma type. And we should now apply iterated elimination of dominated strategies just like we normally would. I want to be clear about one thing here. Notice that if player two is the stag hunt type, player one does not have a dominant strategy under those circumstances. If the stag hunt type were to play left, he would want to play left. If the stag hunt type were to play right, then he would want to play down. But even, that's, even though that is the case, we have a circumstance where player one has a dominant strategy. Why is that the case? Well, let's calculate player one's expected utilities for his two peer strategies, up and down. His payoff for up is as follows. 0.9% of the time, or 0.9 portion of the time, 90% of the time, he's playing against the prisoner's dilemma type. And if he's playing up, the prisoner's dilemma type plays right and he gets a payoff of zero. The remaining 10% of the time depends on what player two as the stag hunts type chooses as a mixed strategy. Let's call that mixed strategy sigma L, representing the percentage of the time that the stag hunt type chooses left. That means that player one, conditional on facing that stag hunt type, will receive a payoff of three with probability sigma L and zero with probability one minus sigma L. So if we combine those two things together, add them up and multiply them by their relative probabilities, that's player one's overall expected utility for playing up. Now let's do the same thing for down. For down, 90% of the time, he'll be playing against the prisoner's dilemma type, which plays right, which gives player one a payoff of one. And the remaining 10% of the time, with probability sigma left, he receives a payoff of two. And with probability one minus sigma left, he receives a payoff of one. Now let's put all of that information together on one slide. Let's compare down to up. And I claim that down strictly dominates up. The first two bullet points simply copy what we've calculated in the last two slides. The third bullet point takes the expected utility for down and compares it to the expected utility for up. On the right side of the inequality, we have the expected utility for up. And I've done some erasing. I've gotten rid of all of those ones, or rather all of those zeros that have been appearing. So the expected utility for up actually simplifies to a small figure, which is 0.3 times sigma left. Notice that the expected utility for up therefore maximizes at 0.3 when sigma left is equal to 1. If we look at the remaining part of the inequality, the left side of the inequality, we see that we have a payoff of 0.9 plus some complex expression, which as it comes down to it is a value of 2 and a value of 1 multiplied in all sorts of different ways by probabilities. But no matter how you slice those probabilities, if you're taking a 2 and a 1, that is going to be a strictly positive value. So if we have 0.9 plus a positive value, that has to be greater than a value that maximizes that 0.3. So down strictly dominates up. And that's despite the fact in the stag hunt situation where player two is actually that stag hunt type, there is no dominated strategy for player one. What's going on here is that there's an overwhelming percentage of the time where player two is the prisoner's dilemma type. And if player two is that prisoner's dilemma type, player one has a dominant strategy. That's to play down. One is greater than zero. And so as a consequence of the fact that the stag hunt type is so unlikely, it doesn't matter what the stag hunt type chooses. Player one is always going to be dedicating his strategy to best responding to what the prisoner's dilemma type is doing. And so as a consequence of that, there is a dominant strategy for player one, despite the fact that conditional on playing against the stag hunt type, he might want to do something else. You might think about this in the extreme if you don't really fully understand why that's the case. Imagine that you were playing the prisoner's dilemma type with probability 1. In other words, you were certainly playing against the prisoner's dilemma type. Well, obviously you're going to be choosing down. 
But that logic should extend to situations where there's some very, very, very small probability that you're also facing the stag hunt type. That's what's going on here. All right, let's wrap this up. What do you do with dominance? Well, you do exactly what you've done previously. It doesn't matter what kind of dominance you find in these Bayesian games. If it's interim dominance, if it's ex-ante dominance, doesn't matter. Who cares? You eliminate it. If you do that, if you have a strictly dominated strategy and you eliminate it, you're not going to lose any Bayesian Nash equilibrium. Just like you wouldn't lose any Nash equilibrium if you eliminated a strictly dominated strategy in a complete information game. The one caveat here, though, is with weak dominance. With weak dominance in these Bayesian games, you can still risk eliminating some Bayesian Nash equilibria, so you need to be careful there. But once more, as long as you can figure out a way to find dominance, even if it's in one of those strange hidden ways that we've seen here, you should still get rid of it if it's a strictly dominated strategy and go from there. All right, that wraps up this lecture on dominance. Join me next time when we get into some applications of Bayesian Nash equilibria and games of incomplete information.